Praise God. Am I on? I'm on. Am I on? Uh, praise God. I'm really blessed to be here. I, uh, <clears throat> I got saved here, like uh, Pastor Mike said. I got saved here. I got a, got a demon cast out of me here. I got filled with the Holy Ghost here. Met my wife here. Got married here. Had my children here. Uh, three of them anyways. Uh, got ordained here. The other one we had in Alabama. <laughs> Uh, uh, got sent out here, got recommissioned here, got sent out again here. So this is a real big part of my life. Uh, last week, my wife and I have been married for 41 years. Uh, and so we went out to celebrate our anniversary, and uh, we went out and ate, you know, and it's a you know, it's always a, a joyful time, your anniversary, but it, you know, you reflect on things. And so I said to her, Allison, uh, you have to embrace your mistakes. And she got up and hugged me. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> I, uh, I read that on a t-shirt the other day. I just had to incorporate it. Uh, if you have a Bible, Joshua chapter 14. Uh, I'm going to preach a message entitled, uh, Keeping Your Head in the Game. And so... Uh, I put this message together a couple weeks ago, and Allison puts our PowerPoint together. She looked on Google, and on the first or second page of Google, Pastor Warner's picture popped up. So uh, I think he did a sermon series, maybe, or a blog post, something. But anyways, I put this together. I'm not stealing his sermon. Uh, I really, literally want to preach about keeping your head in the game uh, this evening. Uh, I read an article called How to Maintain Peak Brain Health. Scientists say it comes down to three factors. So uh, I want to talk about staying mentally fit as life goes on. Amen. Uh, the text we're going to read is about an older guy, Caleb. It's a very well-known story who, after all the wanderings in the wilderness, was still in the game. Uh, it's kind of a common old guy theme. Uh, but I, if you look around, I think you could make a case that... Uh, Diminished mental capacity is kind of showing all over the spectrum, if, you, if we'd be honest. Uh, if uh, I read a uh, part of the article, if you often feel people around you are getting dumber with every passing day, hello, weird TikTok videos, you might just be right. The humans are actually getting stupider. A, recently, a recent study conducted by researchers at Norway's Ragnar Frisch Center for Economic Research is proof enough. Uh, the study says... Uh, they conducted a, re a, a, a research to figure out average IQ scores. They studied 730,000 IQ tests given to Norwegian men entering the military. The results were shocking, to say the least. Uh, there's a thing called the Flynn effect, which uh, for, for decades, average IQs have been going up. Uh, and that, a lot of that has to do with nutrition, ed education, different things. But around the beginning of the 20th century... Uh, researchers witnessed a decline in IQ or a reversal of the Flynn effect. It's official. The average IQ scores are declining by an average of seven points with every generation. They cited the Kiki and bottle cap challenges. How many know what the Kiki challenge is? Anybody? Uh, somebody probably knows what that is. I'd never heard of it before. I mentioned it in a group I did at my job, and one of the clients said, oh, that's old. That happened four years ago, but it's not old to me. What the Kiki challenge is is uh, jumping out of a moving vehicle, dancing in the road. Uh, thousands of people dancing to Drake's In My Feeling song. It's just another craze to be part of. Over the past few weeks, the rise of In My Feelings challenge has been hard to ignore, uh, the viral stunt has people around the world getting out of moving cars, getting down low to the lyrics, Kiki, do you love me? Are you riding? Say you'll never leave beside me. The dare is tricky because it re requires the person to both dance in tune with the song while keeping up with the speed of the car. The challenge is completed once the person manages to jump back into the car without any injuries after finishing the dance successfully. In some videos uploaded to social media, people can be seen crashing into poles, tumbling out of their vehicles, being hit by cars, tripping on potholes while attempting the deer. In one video, two men in motorbikes can be seen stealing a woman's handbag as she attempts the challenge. So that's the Kiki challenge. Uh, why are folks getting stupid? 
Glad you asked. Some of the suggestions making the rounds include a, a drastic change in the way we lead our lives. The list includes terrible eating habits, increased dependence on the internet, rampant use of social media, the unhealthy amount of time we spend staring at our phone screens. While there's no definite reason in sight, picking up a book and cutting down on screen time might be beneficial, who knows. Uh, the bottle cap challenge apparently involves trying to kick the cap off a, a sealed bottle. Just sounds kind of like harmless idiocy. Uh, I do have a disclaimer here. When I was uh, uh, an adolescent, coming home from junior high school, and then we would do it in the evening also, we used to, I grew up in western New York, and in western New York, from about November to April, there's a perma coat of frost and snow on the ground. We used to what we called hop cars. You would hide behind the bushes, and somebody would stop at a stop sign, and you'd get out and you'd kneel down behind the car and hang onto the bumper and go for a ride. And it was a lot of fun until you hit a dry spot. Uh, then I progressed when I was a uh, little older teenager. We used to go out and party, and then we would go to the laundromat and get in the dryer, and somebody would put money in. It was kind of like a cheap amusement park ride. So I haven't always been the smartest guy in the, uh, I haven't always been the smartest guy in the room. So I want to look this morning at keeping our wits about us. How many want to keep your brain working? It's a good thing. Good thing to have a brain. There's an old, uh, an old commercial by the United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Amen. So Joshua 14, beginning with verse 6, if you'd follow along. Uh, the children of Israel came to Joshua and Gilgal. Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Canaanite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. I brought back word to him uh, as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt but I wholly follow the Lord my God. Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you've wholly followed the Lord my God. Now, there, now behold, the Lord's kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke the word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old, yet I'm as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. You've heard in that day how the Anakim were there and the cities were great and fortified. It may be the Lord will be with me and I'll be able to drive them out as the Lord said. Joshua blessed him, gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now, God, help us, Lord. Uh, Father, to seek you. Give us passion for the things of God. Uh, Father, help us to focus on you. Help the Word of God to take root in hearts this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the article that I read, which was an inspiration for this message, it was, uh, it was on, you know, you see these websites. They got a bunch of links. Uh, it's a website I read sometimes, a news feed. And, uh, <clears throat> and it had a link that said, uh, uh, how to keep your brain healthy. And so I thought that sounds like something I probably need. Uh, what's the best way to maintain peak brain health as we age? Countless study detailing ways to prevent cognitive decline. So scientists in Norway, all the stuff's in Norway, sought to simplify the science of managing strong brain health. The three recommendations. The keys to our nervous system are gray and white matter, says some guy whose name I can't say, a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, Department of Psychology. Gray matter is made up of nerve cells, neurons, and dendrites, while white matter works to facilitate contact between the cells. That's called myelin. Contributes to the transmission speed and distribution of the signals. If one can keep their white and gray matter in shape, cognition, thinking skills, and memory should function smoothly as well. This is a, a public service announcement. Methamphetamine destroys the myelin in your brain and literally makes you stupider. Just saying. Uh, uh, okay, so anyways, they identified three keys to strong brain health and their physical exercise, social activity, strong, passionate interests, and hobbies. So I'm going to break these down a little bit. The first one they cite is physical exercise. Now, this has always been a big one for me. I usually try to run about six miles before breakfast. Then I eat some raw eggs and uh, kale, and then I try to bench about 400 pounds. Uh, I, I never have done that in my life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's common knowledge that spending all day on the couch isn't healthy for the body. 
Physical activity is also key to brain health. An active lifestyle helps to develop the central nervous system to counteract the aging of the brain, according to study authors. Researchers show consistency is essential. Do your best to get in at least a little movement each and every day. If you work a sedentary job uh, that requires lots of sitting, get moving every hour or so for just a few minutes at the very least. Uh, during COVID, I worked from home virtually for a year and a half or a year. And I started to have a whole lot of physical problems. My knees started going. I had stomach problems. I went back to working in person and uh, feel a whole lot better. Amen. Uh, the worst thing for your health is to sit around and do nothing. I understand sometimes people are disabled. They have problems. But sitting around is not good for you. Uh, not just true for older people. Listen to this. A full 27% of young Americans are simply too overweight to join the military. Uh, many are turned away by recruiters. Others never try to join. Of those who attempt to join, roughly 15,000 young potential recruits fail their entrance physical every year because they're too heavy. Nearly 32% of other disqualifying health problems, including asthma, eyesight or hearing problems, mental health issues, or recent treatment for ADHD. Due to all the above and other assorted problems, only about two out of every 10 American young people uh, are fully eligible to join the military without special waivers. Imagine 10 young people walking into a recruiter's office and seven of them turned away. Uh, we cannot allow today's dropout crisis to become a national security crisis. So sitting around all day playing Call of Duty or whatever is probably not real good for your health. Uh, it's interesting, though, uh, reading that, that there's a generation that are not physically able to join the military, and yet they're trying to jump in and out of moving cars to do a TikTok challenge. You know. Riddle me that one, Batman. How's that work? Uh, you know, I'm not a doctor, and I don't even play one on TV like Dr. Fauci, but I, even I know that our long-term mental, emotional, and spiritual fitness is, tr is tied to doing the best we can to take care of ourselves. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the message says, May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, repeats himself, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. Amen. You know, when we were pastoring in Alabama, uh, they love to eat in Alabama. I mean, and I could throw down with the best of them. We had a lady in our church, lived out in the country. She would make 15 uh, course meals. I, I loved it, the holidays. Every holiday she would do that. Uh, but I used to love to embrace the verse, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, reject profane and old wives' fables, exercise yourself towards godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is, that which is to come. In one sense, that verse kind of confronts the whole gym culture, which is all, a whole lot of it's about narcissism and self-centeredness, etc. But I used to misread that scripture at times, probably willfully, but it, I used to read it as physical exercise profits little. So, well, I guess it's just a waste of time exercising. It says it profits little. You know, I was doing hard physical work at the time. That's not what the verse says. It says physical exercise profits a little. Uh, you can't leave the A out. There is a benefit to exercise and eating right and taking care of yourself. Amen. Uh, obviously, for the Christian, spiritual exercise, prayer, reading, uh, your Bible, coming to church, witnessing, etc., are more important. Uh, there's a saying in the recovery world that I work in, what we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. How much more so in our walk with God? Our walking in victory depends on being connected to the Holy Ghost, uh, having a prayer life, maintaining our spiritual condition, uh, reading our Bible, coming to church, etc. Uh, on the other hand, though, it's, it's critical that you take care of your physical health or you're going to get older and you're going to have a lot of problems. Amen. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12, all things are lawful to me, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, I'll not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach, stomach for foods, God will destroy both it and them. The body's not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, Lord for the body. God both raised up the Lord and also, and God both raised up the Lord and also will raise us up by his power. Do you not know your body are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Uh, when it says all things are lawful, it doesn't mean, you know, smoking crack is lawful or, you know, fornicating. Uh, 
it, it doesn't mean sin is okay, but it means that Christianity is not a series of do's and don'ts. Amen. It's about having a walk with God, having a relationship with God. The Bible never, I've read the Bible through several times, different translations. I've never read a, read a verse that says, thou shalt not eat two monster thick burgers, half a chocolate cake, and wash it down with a 40-ounce soda. It doesn't say that anywhere. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. The, the, the verse says all things are lawful, not all things are helpful or expedient. In other words, all things aren't going to help me uh, to, to profit in life. If I don't take care of myself physically, it won't benefit me mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. Amen. Uh, the passage continues, 1 Corinthians six nineteen and 20. Do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You're bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Verse is basically saying that the Lord owns us, body, mind, and spirit, when we get saved. And it's kind of like renting a house. When you rent a house, you're not allowed to remodel it, uh, without asking, at least, anyways. Uh, I've had some tenants in houses I rented, remodeled it, like by knocking holes in the wall and not paying the utility bill and things like that. Uh, uh, it ought to factor into our lifestyle choices, though, being, being a Christian. Diabetes 2, cardiac problems, uh, respiratory problems, joint problems are largely caused uh, by lifestyle choices. Amen. Too much carbs, not enough exercise. Amen. I'm preaching to me, too. When I preached this sermon in, in Kentucky, I had to touch on the third rail of, of Kentucky, which is smoking cigarettes. They grow tobacco in Kentucky. I seen it hanging from barns the other day, and everybody smokes. Uh, there's a, uh, Mark Twain said, giving up smoking is the easiest thing in the world, I know, because I've done it thousands of times. Uh, amen. <laughs> now there's somebody else that said, smoking is the leading cause of statistics. Uh, amen. <laughs> it's also the bourbon capital. You, uh, you go to the airport, and all down the ramp coming into the city are bourbon signs. We were flying out of there. These ladies were on the plane. They'd been to a convention in Louisville. All they talked about was how drunk they got. I mean, that's, that's my city's famous for it. Or maybe uh, it's a spirit. Maybe you might want to try something different to represent your city. Uh, the second factor in keeping your head in the game is socialization. Uh, the article said some people are naturally more social than others. Researchers stress no one is an island. Even if you prefer a quiet night into attending a party, make an effort to stay in touch with the people who matter to you. Our brains thrive on social interaction and connections. Relationships with other people interacting with them contribute to a number of complex biological factors that can prevent the brain from slowing down. The bottom line is we desperately need one another. We desperately need to be part of a, the community, also known as the church. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we're encountering in America and in the world today is all the social problems resulting from the shutdown they did from COVID-19. COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown measures led to social isolation that affected severely the mental health of the general population all over the world, causing increase in mental distress, depression, anxiety, uh, Changes in feelings and lifestyle, reduced physical activity, unhealthy eating habits, inadequate sleep quality, feelings of loneliness, and on and on. I remember reading a story during the COVID thing. Uh, a kid in my city, our city's full of addiction, our part of the country, the Appalachian region. And uh, this young guy had been sober for three and a half years from heroin addiction. And uh, they closed his church. They shut down his recovery meeting, and he lost his job, and he, he relapsed and overdosed and died. Uh, we desperately need to be part of a community. Uh, to be well, we desperately need one another. You know, there's a thing that I, uh, a study I read that I, I really like it. I, I tell my clients this all the time. I, I work with addicts, and you can't get well on your own. You have to be part of something, whether it's all the AA stuff or a church or something. You have to have people in your life to help you to recover. But there's a study they call the Rat Park Experiment. Uh, they do studies on, uh, on drugs using rats and mice. They do that because rats and mice are social animals, so they kind of resemble human behavior. Uh, it's interesting. Nowadays, a lot of people in our world are kind of resembling rat behavior, but I don't know <laughs> how that works. But anyways, so they do these studies. They always did these studies where they would take a rat. They did mice and cocaine, and they did rats and heroin for some reason. I don't know if the, that's what they like or whatever, but they would do these experiments. They would put a rat in a little cage. They would have water, and they would have morphine water. And the rats invariably would choose the water with morphine in it. 
And that, so the conclusion they reached is you can't resist that drug when you're exposed to it. And this doctor named Paul Alexander in Canada said, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this study. So he made this thing called Rat Park. It was like Disneyland for rats. It was a huge cage. There was 20 rats in it, 10 male rats, 10 female rats. They had little treadmills and tubes they could run through and rat treats and whatever rats eat. Uh, and so he took some rats and they were only in the little cage. Those rats that were only in the little cage for the experiment all drank the morphine water. The, rats, the other rats were only in Rat Park. They hardly drank the morphine water at all. The only ones that did were a few females. Now, I don't know what, the stu what that means in the study, but <laughs> just saying. But then he took some other rats. They started out in Rat Park, and then they went to the little cage. They all started drinking the morphine water. He took some other rats, and they started out in the, uh, the little cage. They went to Rat Park, and they quit drinking the morphine. When they went in there, he actually did one study where for 58 days, these rats in the little cage only had the morphine water. So they had no choice. And he put them in Rat Park, and they actually went through withdrawal and quit drinking it. So that what he learned in that study is that we need other people, community, socialization is how you get well. This guy did a TED Talk on it that's been watched all over the world. But the, the, study, the, the lesson in it is that we become well in connection with other people, and thank God for the church. During the heart of COVID, we, were, uh, we kept our church open the whole time during COVID because we could kind of fly under the radar because we're small. But I remember one time there was a sermon workshop in Illinois like three and a half hours away, uh, and I drove there just because I was going nuts, just because of being alone and being isolated and working at home. It was such a wonderful thing. Three and a half hours there, three and a half hours back, just spending time with about 10 other guys in the Carbondale Church there. It was so helpful. Uh, one of my favorite Bible verses, Acts 2, 41 through 47, the birth of the church. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. That day about 3,000 souls were added to him. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had need, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. It's descriptive words there. They gladly received the word. They were breaking bread together. Uh, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity, praising the Lord, having favor with all the people, having all things common. It's a picture of a common life shared, the life of Christ. That's how the church was birthed. Uh, and uh, that beautiful Bible word, fellowship, koinonia, intimate spiritual communion, and participate sharing in a common religious commitment and spiritual community. And living the common life of faith is tremendously beneficial to your mental health and mind. Uh, there's a last day's context to it. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some, exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know, I marvel at folks that backslide now. The world is so insane. I mean, where are you, where are you going? You know, it's like jumping on the Titanic, you know, buying passage on the Titanic about five feet from the earthquake or from the iceberg. Uh, you know, we were last week, we were in Owensboro, Kentucky at a festival. I was standing in line to buy a mutton sandwich. You know, I, this is an interesting thing. I, I, was, I, I preached in Chinle uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and I ate mutton. I was just trying to, you know, relate to the culture and the Navajo culture. I hated it. It was horrible. I, I ate mutton in uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. It was, it was one of the best things I've ever eaten. I don't know how, why they do it differently in Kentucky. At any rate, getting off topic here. The Gideons were there. If you know who the Gideons are, the Gideons give out Bibles. They put Bibles in hotel rooms. I think they still do that. But they, uh, the, the Gideons were giving out Bibles, and I was watching the people in line. They were right next to the line of people getting sandwiches, and all these people are just shining it on. No, I don't need that. They're giving out New Testaments. No, I don't need that. I'm thinking, yeah, you do. <laughs> you, need, you need to get right. You need to get saved. You need to get in church. The world's coming apart. 
Hallelujah. Uh, Malachi 3, 16 and 17. Malachi, like many of the Old Testament prophets, spoke of the day of the Lord. said, then those who feared the Lord spoke one to another. The Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord, who meditate on his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day I make them my jewels. I'll spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. In other words, in the last day's chaos, the, the, the healthy community are speaking to each other. That's a picture of the church in these days. Amen. Uh, one other key to sanity and mental well-being, and this is what really probably stirred me the most out of this article, was passion. Uh, the article said, just like bicep curls help us build muscle, keeping the brain active promotes strong lifelong cognition. Consider taking up a new hobby or learning a new skill. Perhaps more importantly, though, don't force it. Find something you're actually passionate about. It's never too late in life to learn something new. Passion or having a strong interest in something can be a decisive driving factor leads us to learn new things. Over time, this impacts the development and maintenance of our neural networks. Uh, Caleb in our text, like we said, he's an old man. Uh, Caleb, if you know the story in, in uh, the book of Numbers, they went and spied out the land, one, one spy from each tribe, and Caleb and Joshua came back with a great report. You know, there's, there's obstacles, but we can well take the land. God had already promised them to give them the land. It wasn't like it was up for grabs. It, it was theirs. But the other 10 spies discouraged the people. We know they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and only Joshua and Caleb out of that generation survived. And here they are, they're in the promised land, and Joshua comes, uh, or Caleb comes to Joshua. It says, now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said these 45 years, ever since the Lord spoke the word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Now here I am this day, 85 years old, yet I'm so strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then. So now is my strength for war, both for going out and coming in. Therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. You heard in that day how the Anakim were there. Cities were great and fortified. Maybe the Lord will be with me. I'll be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. So this brother had been through a 40-year trial, not of his own making. Uh, you know, he, didn't, he wanted to enter the land, and he wasn't able to. Uh, but he still was passionate for the vision that God had put in his heart. He wasn't bitter or disillusioned. He still had some fire in his belly. Uh, Paul, before King Agrippa. Paul's on, at the end of his journey, really. He's before King Agrippa on his way to Rome to be martyred. In Acts 26, 19, he said, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Uh, the, the message says, what could I do, King Agrippa? I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. I became an obedient believer on the spot. I started preaching the life change. This radical turn to God and everything it meant in everyday life, right there in Damascus, went on to Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside, and from there to the whole world. You know, there's a quote that really, that really challenged my heart a few years ago. It's by a man named John Shedd. He was a businessman, I think in like the 1900s early 1900s, he said a, a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Let me say that again. A ship in harbor is safe, but that, that's not what ships are built for. Ships are built to go out into the ocean to venture. Amen. Uh, Nelson Mandela said, there's no passion to be found playing small in settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living. I will tell you, Nelson Mandela backed that up. He, went through, he was imprisoned for, by the apartheid people, uh, the, uh, the uh, one of them guys with the boars in South Africa, but he never allowed it to embitter him. When he got out, he tried to build a country. Uh, you know, uh, my wife and I, uh, I was thinking about our journey the last few years. Uh, we came back here in 2007 from Alabama. We were here for seven years, but uh, I was thinking about we, in 2012, 2013, I was uh, uh, chilling like a villain in Tucson. I mean, we were doing really well. We had money. We had a house we liked. My kids were here. Uh, lots of good things happening. And, uh, you know, half the people in America want to retire and go to and move to Arizona and uh, get a little casita and a golf cart and eat tacos or whatever they do. Uh, my, I was eating breakfast with my sister-in-law this morning. That's what she's doing. Uh, no golf cart. Uh, so here I, I was out here in Tucson doing okay, and God set us up. First, with the opportunity to go back to school, I, my carpentry job dried up when the economy crashed. Uh, got a degree in counseling. And then April 2013, in a revival service, I got a word from uh, evangelist Chris Hart. You know, it was, he came here, I've never seen this before with Pastor Warren, I don't know if he's done it other times, but uh, 
Chris came in December, and uh, December of that year, which would be December 2012, I guess, and uh, I really wanted to get a word from, in the revival, because I know he gives a lot of words out to people. I didn't want to get a word so everybody could say, ooh, he got a word. I wanted to get a word because I really wanted to get some direction from God. We were kind of kind of unsettled, and uh, then he came back in April, like, oh, maybe I'll get a word now. I'm just really trying to get some direction from God, and uh, the last service, the last, I thought they were ready to close the service down, and he gave me a word. And it was like the longest word I've ever heard. I mean, it went on and on and on and on. I actually bought the CD uh, to see what it was, because I couldn't remember it all. And it wasn't on the CD. So I bought another CD later, and it wasn't on that one either. So just saying, if you're the one that makes the CDs, try to put my word on it. Uh, part of that word I do remember, though, is he said, God is going to stir your heart. And he said, you know, God's already stirring your heart, but he's really going to stir your heart. And he did. He, he stirred our heart for a broken, old, post-industrial, Midwestern city called Louisville, Kentucky. Not just for a place, but for broken lives in that city. The working class, you know, you hear all these things about the deplorables and this and that and, you know, all the, the Trump supporters clinging to their guns and religion and all this stuff. We live in that. Uh, the factories are closed. Uh, there's horrible fentanyl and meth problems. People's lives breaking down. Families breaking down. I'll tell you, I, we love what we're doing, my wife and I. In that city, my heart burns to make Jesus known in that city. So fired up for that city. Uh, amen. I, you know, we're just doing everything we can. Uh, you know, I've always, you know, considered myself to be a reasonably intelligent person, uh, con especially considering the prodigious uh, amount of drugs I did when I was younger, which Bill Conrad could testify about. Uh, you know, I probably, uh, I've, I've noticed the last couple of years, probably lost a couple of ticks off my fastball, but I want to tell you, my head's still in the game. My head is in the game. And I tell you, I attribute a lot of that to staying passionate for God and for being involved in life, for, for being involved in reaching people, for being involved in trying to make a difference in our world, that and having a wife that takes care of me also, amen. Uh, you know, I have a, called the jukebox in my mind, there's an old song by Neil Young, said it's better to burn out than to rust out. And I, I believe that, amen. Uh, you know, I, I want to tell you the legacy that Pastor Mitchell gave to a lot of us, I know he gave to me, was a passion for God a passion for evangelism, a passion to reach the world. I still got that, amen. You know, there's a poem. I was just thinking about this earlier uh, this afternoon. There's a poem called The Second Coming. It was written in the early 1900s by a man named W.B. Yeats. He was Irish. I don't know anything about him, really, but I read this poem. This poem has some things in it that are pretty prophetic. This is part of the poem. And there's a couple words in here. I have no idea what they mean. One of them is the word gyre, G-Y-R-E. I have no idea what that means. But he said, turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is, is, uh, is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The, la the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I want to tell you that last line there, the worst are full of passionate intensity. The devil, is, the devil ain't sleeping. <laughs> and neither are his people. There's such a passion that sin has in our world, and we need, we need all that much more passion for God and what God has for our lives. And I'll tell you what, it'll keep you alive. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've seen Pastor Mitchell in the Midwest when he was, man, I mean, about right, not too long before he died, and he was, he was kind of, you know, losing a few miles, a few MPHs off his fastball, but he was still, he was still involved. I seen a guy a couple years before he died, man, fly in from like India or something and preach a revival. I, I'm thinking, man, you know, I mean, we're, we, we're aging, things are happening, but the passion for God, never lose it. I want to tell you, it'll keep you young, it'll keep your mind functioning and sitting around watching videos and being stupid and doing all them things. It just, it's just a waste of time, waste of our lives. So that said, uh, that's enough, uh, enough of that. Uh, let's bow our heads tonight, close our eyes and reverence to God.